Welcome back to Open Relationships, Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by my my amazing co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and our amazing producer, Brian Atkins. We have the most incredible show teed up for you today. We interviewed Mark Groves, and oh boy, he delivered. We went really interesting places. When it comes to open relationships, we got really open with Mark Groves. So let me introduce our guest, Mark Groves. All right, I am thrilled to introduce our guest today, Mark Groves. Mark Groves is a human connection specialist, writer, founder of Create the Love, a platform that guides you to design the life and love you've longed for, and host of the Mark Groves podcast, as well as an object of great fascination on the Your Tango team. We are all pretty obsessed with you, as we were telling you a few minutes ago, Mark. Mark's work bridges the academic and the human, inviting people to explore the good, the bad, the downright ugly, and the beautiful sides of connection. Also, it's a really special day because Mark has his book on sale today. It's called Liberated Love. It is out today. You can get it at Amazon and Barnes & Noble and anywhere where you get books. Mark, congratulations and welcome to our show. Thanks so much. And I'm so excited to be here. What an intro. Yeah, well, we're, we're excited too. I like this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have a huge studio audience. If you didn't see all those people when you walked in, <laughs> I could feel it. I could feel it. Okay, um, I wanted to start by asking: you reference a number of times in your materials this idea of rock bottom. What do you, what happened? You know, I think rock bottom as a concept, we sort of traditionally think of it as like someone with an addiction waking up in a bad in a place they don't want to be and maybe wanted to be at the height of their addiction or their their night out um for me my rock i mean i feel like life delivers more than one rock bottom and i think of it more as emotionally uh, although rock bottoms can be obviously of service to us when they're with things like substances i think they really do show up when we sort of reach the end of the ability to pretend to be someone or not live a life we don't want, stop um, where we're not prioritizing ourselves, where we abandon ourselves, where we don't use our voice. And it's easy to build a life like that. It's easy to do that because in my experience, most people do that. And so that's kind of what a normal life is, is one that doesn't center oneself, which is very different than being self-centered, you know, because centering oneself is about also honoring other people and yourself, not um, centering yourself at the cost of relationship. So for me, that really began, I would say, you know, that idea of the the first time I awakened, which I think is a journey. So I'll never tell the universe I've done it because I'll get another cosmic two by four. I, um, it was when I was 27 and I went through, I was engaged and I went through the ending of that engagement Actually, getting engaged was was a huge part of the process of that because I, it forced me through the engagement. We had been together for five years, and you know everyone else around us was getting engaged, and it was the next logical step. And it was part of my uh, Catholic programming when I was growing up, like get married by a certain age, have kids by a certain age, get this kind of job, become a good provider. And I'm I finally met the moment I was always taught to want. So I got engaged and I remember once I got engaged, after she said yes, I was thinking to myself, like, I think I'm supposed to be more excited than this. But there was not really a lot of space for conversation with people around me about it because I was anxious about it. And when I would bring it forward to people, they would say to me, oh, you're just a man, you're just afraid of commitment. It's normal to feel that way when you get engaged. And I thought, ah, I don't think so. And I also thought it was interesting because, you know, we're told as men that we need to be more emotionally intelligent and express ourselves. And the moment I express how I'm feeling, I'm told I don't actually feel that way. So I um, got on the internet and I looked up things like, how do you know if someone's the one? And it led me down a deep rabbit hole to making the decision that that, that relationship was not for me. And I... um that was really the birth of everything. That was the birth of, at the time I was in pharmaceutical sales, 
and I was really good at sales and I was successful at it. And I thought to myself, why am I so good at talking about everything but my feelings? Like, this isn't a skill set issue. There's something else going on here. So I, I dove deep into studying relationships from that place because I was but hang like, on. I, I just want to, I want to interrupt. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. when I think about you got engaged and you were with this person for five years, bring us back to that moment. Was it like, hey, I can't do this. And she freaked out and you freaked out. Or I mean, what happened in that? Whew, man, that was a conversation in the kitchen. I think that's where all those conversations happen. Uh, she got home from work and I'd been stewing on it, thinking about it and, and had consulted, you know, people about it and just made the decision that I needed to. And she said, what's going on? What's wrong with you? And I said, um, I need to talk to you. Like, this isn't working for me. And you know, I, I can't really remember all the dialogue because that was, you know, <laughs> I'm older now. That was, it, oh, no, what was that, 18 years ago. I just remember crying, like both of us crying on the couch and and my dog licking my hand. And I remember that. And just kind of Did you feel like you didn't happening. love her? Or, I mean, what what was it that that caused you to go, this isn't for me? And it, was it her or was it just the whole construct? Like you said, the Catholic programming, was it just like, hey, I'm living some, you know, I'm living this prescribed life. So I'm trying to figure out how much of it was her, ver I mean, versus you, quite honestly. So many beautiful layers. First off, uh, it wasn't her. She was an incredible person. That was what made it so hard is because it was like she was everything I was taught to want. Uh, the, the real like deeper layer of it is that I hadn't chosen someone I hadn't let someone actually love me in a long time. I'd been through a couple betrayals in my late teens, my early 20s, and I didn't know, but I had pivoted to becoming quite avoidant after that. And so I was with her for five years. I was in a relationship for five years. And to think that you can be in all of that and not be available is kind of wild to consider. But I hadn't confronted the betrayals I'd been through. I'd never really like sat through and processed them. And so what was relational anxiety and not being able to choose this relationship, which in hindsight, I wouldn't change anything. It's exactly what I needed. And I wasn't capable of choosing it. I had a lot of work to do before I could ever show up to a, ever show up to a woman who could choose me. I mean, I ran from women who could choose me for years after that because I still hadn't discovered that I was really afraid of where commitment led. Well, Mark, let me interrupt really quick. When you say you ran from women who could choose you, in what sense do you mean that? Well, you know, I loved women who were just out of relationships. So then I could help support their rehabilitation. And then thus they would need me and see my immense value. And um, when someone needs you, the perception is that they can't leave you because they need you. And this is the framework of codependency. This is the framework of... Um, people in relationship with addicts is that there is an element that unconsciously we create the power dynamic where the person has something that needs to be resolved. And we just happen to be the one with the special set of skills to resolve that. So it was that. And as soon as a woman could, you know, said, I like you, or I care about you, or I choose you when I was dating after that, I was like, "Woof, I can't. Because they or could th then choose to leave too. Exactly. Well, they were choosing me. And in a lot of ways, I was afraid that then it would deepen and then they would betray me in the end, right? The story would play out because I hadn't actually done the deep excavation of the betrayal that I'd been through. And it was that mainly, I mean, um, I don't know much about your background. You, I think you've written about how your you know, mom was a feminist and I, f I forget how you um, referenced your dad, but it, it sounded like a pretty good upbringing or, uh, I mean, some part of me is thinking like, okay, I can hear betrayals in my 20s and I don't want to project as a as a person who comes from a family with a lot of addiction but was there something and probably codependency and all that stuff too if I'm being honest um when you look back to what you learned growing up was there was was that what was modeled to you there wasn't addiction in my immediate family but definitely my family tree and lots of it I mean half of my family's Irish so there's a few you know drinkers in there uh the but not even addiction. Sure. I'm trying to figure out like where you're like where you were unable to have the kind of really healthy relationship 
in you know in your 20s that you've been able to create as you've gotten older my observation is or i'm connecting dots that i'm that i'm trying to connect honestly that you didn't know how to do that because you you that didn't happen around you and that's i mean honestly that's been my story so you know i'm trying to understand just where you know kind of what your background was growing up yeah so i'm the youngest of 3 i was really blessed my mom was definitely a feminist my father was the one I generally talked to about my relational stuff. And we philosophized human behavior all the time, which is probably where a lot of that was born. Um, but I really, my mom was overwhelmed when I was a kid. And I was, as the youngest, I really spent my time trying to oscillate around her emotion. I see that I was, you know, fairly enmeshed with her in terms of like, if she, if, if mom's okay, I'm okay. Right. And that's how subtle it can be. You know, we had a healthy, quote unquote, healthy childhood, but this is how subtle it can be is that, you know, then when I was in relationships in my teens and 20s, I didn't have access to my voice. I didn't have access to boundaries. I didn't have access to my own needs because when you're enmeshed with someone, you don't develop a full self because when you're pivoting around other people's feelings, whether it's an addict, a narcissist, someone who's angry, someone who's just emotionally unpredictable sometimes then you, their feelings become your feelings, you know? And so the, when I was in my teens and my twenties, like even in those relationships where those betrayals happen, you know, think about it. I grew up also in the eighties and nineties. So a lot of the messaging around men was really shifting then to that men are bad, men are evil, men are rapists, men are murderers. I mean, that's even more amplified today than it was then. And so I didn't want to have, I didn't realize that boundaries were not being controlling. You know, I thought if I had boundaries, that was being controlling. And the last thing I wanted to be like was like the men I learned about in the news and heard about from feminists. Yeah. Mark, you're saying something that is it's really hitting me because I feel like I identify with your mother. You know, I'm a feminist and I do get overwhelmed. I don't know who doesn't, but I'm thinking about how we're saying you had a good childhood. There wasn't abuse. There wasn't really neglect. There wasn't something truly like what you're saying, dangerous or or like really risky. But you still ended up with a wound. And I think what it brings up in me is that everybody is probably coming into adulthood with a wound of some sort. And what ends up happening is if we are not taught how to process that or don't know how to put that wound in a safe place to heal it, that's when we end up truly stunted, so to speak, by the wound. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I don't think anyone gets out of childhood unscathed in some way. And that's not in that. I don't think that's evidence of uh, necessarily a rampant amount of poor parenting, although poor parenting does exist. It's more evidence of um, just the human experience, that it's so unique to our own lens of our experience, you know, and yeah, you th we often project on people who have everything, quote unquote, whose families have lots of wealth that they have no concerns, but then they often feel like their parents weren't present for them. So, you know, it's like we're all handed a bag. I think the most important thing as a parent, as I am one now, but in my experience, even as a child, is that through when when a parent can regulate their own emotions when a human can regulate their own experience and that is how a child learns how to self-regulate a child doesn't know how to regulate till they're about three and the only way they even learn how to self-regulate is through co-regulation from a regulated parent well and especially I mean, a regulated let me just mother. say regulating i mean just because i feel like that can be kind of a um very jargony term. So t so what do you mean by regulating and co-regulating? So people aren't like, what are they freaking talking about? Yeah, 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 no problem. So the nervous system is, you know, the when we think about the nervous system and how we respond in things, I think for those listening or watching, we would understand that when we get in conflict with our partner, maybe we get activated. Activated just means like you could feel in your body something's coming up. That's usually where- You're uh, reacting our, usually, right? You exactly. Feel, you feel so, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our nervous system is starting to get a bit what they call dysregulated, which means regulation is when you can make really great choices, your free prontal cortex is working. Regulation is how you think you're going to respond before you actually respond with the productive thing you learned on a YouTube channel or a podcast is of how you should be versus you go back to some sort of behavior like defensiveness 
because as you know, you were saying, Andrea, that it's this encoded response. It's the response that you learned as age as old as time. And, you know, there's that saying that neurons that fire together, wire together. So familiar paths are the fastest place to go. So we go into fight, flight, freeze. Most people would be familiar with those terms and fawn. Fawning is people pleasing. So when an adult, when a human has the ability to regulate, self-regulate means I'm able to, when I feel activated, I have the ability to calm myself down and think rationally. Or, or step or recognize, be smart enough to say, I'm freaked out right now and I'm going to step away um, before I do any damage, right? That's what, that's what I'm trying to do better. <laughs> I mean, just same, keep it real. Same, same, same. Well, and I always think with our kids, even just opening up to them about what you're feeling and recognizing that you're feeling it. Like these mornings where I'm having trouble getting you out the door to go to school are really stressful for me. And I know that I'm letting that stress get the best of me. And I'm sorry that sometimes that comes out with a raised voice or or frustration. And I'm going to work on that. Like I'm going to get up a little earlier. I'm going to drink more water. I'm going to have a little more high protein food, <laughs> you know, depending on how old your kid is. Because that's what I can do to help not fall into this trap of we got to go, 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 go. That just raises our stress levels. And then my my hope with my kids is that they see me admitting the feeling because it feels like sometimes when a, a kid is in a chaotic or unhappy or scary situation, the worst thing is when it feels like the parent is going, no, 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 everything's fine. Because it's like developmental gaslighting almost in a way. And like, and I wonder if that's how someone like you or me, we end up being so hypervigilant to our parents because we don't necessarily know that they're going to tell us what's going on. That's what happened in my childhood, at least. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a an element of like, if your parent is going through something and they're not able to be fully present and attuned to you, that's going to be experienced by, I mean, a child has two choices when a parent doesn't fully show up for them, uh, either the child is flawed or the parent is flawed, but because it's too compromising for a child to believe their parents flawed, they usually internalize it. And so these are the kinds of things that we like tether out as an adult. And this is what we see run down the family tree. You know, my mother's father died when she was seven. She did not have a regulated mother around her for obvious reasons, overwhelm all the circumstances. And that's why context is important to understand what creates any way of being relationally because it allows us to offer compassion to where it comes from, but it doesn't mean we don't have to change it or heal it or or learn, you know? And I think about how much of attachment work is really about, you know, if you think about some of the most important aspects of attachment is that the mother is attuned to the baby, right? To the baby's needs. There's so many things that happen in our world today that can make that impossible. I think even more so now that I dive so much deeper into the parenting stuff, is that all of it just demonstrates to me how under-resourced parents are and how our society, like in the U.S., is it, what's the minimum or the maximum time for mat leave? Isn't it like six weeks? Like what mother can be off for six weeks and not be with their baby like till the baby's one, two? Like it makes sense to me that we are all <laughs> experiencing what we're experiencing. And it's not anyone's fault, but it is the experience of the systems, you know? Yeah. So, so touching on what you were referencing, Joanna, and, and in, in a lot of your work, I mean, something that I got really excited about is I got to know what you do on Instagram and TikTok and so forth is you talk about being committed to the exploration of truth and where I am in my life and my family. And, and it sounds similar to you, like had a family that loved me very much, but I've had, you know, personally, it's like, ooh, confronting some realities that have been hard, you know, really hard for me. And I'm hearing it from a bunch of my cousins. And so this idea of, of being able to, to talk about these things more openly is, is something that I feel like is really scary, but really important. And so I'm just wondering when you talk about your being committed to the exploration of truth, what, what's that about? Because that, that can be pretty cerebral versus like, oh my gosh, you just went right to the, you know, serious like heart of things you know i mean so what do you what are you trying to achieve there well for me it's it's the recognition that relationships and usually family systems pivot around truths that they don't want to talk about so the whole if you think about families when we grow up in them let's say dad's an alcoholic 
often the family, everyone in the family takes on a role to be able to navigate that. To enable that. Algo, right. But and we so don't talk this, about it. <laughs> no. And and so what happens is, is everyone puts on a mask and wears these disguises. And what ends up looking like personality ends up being what is the adaptive strategy that they've developed. So as adults, they find themselves in these interesting relationships where they can't tell the truth about things, but the very framework of their childhood taught them that the truth wasn't safe to confront because it meant dad having to face his addiction issues. It meant the family having to sit with the idea that let's say dad's the provider, just in a more traditional idea of, of how it might have happened historically. It's like, then do we have safety and money if dad leaves? Do we have, right? Like there's all these different things that are important for context to wonder why, because you might be in a relationship and you see something on someone's phone or you see something pop up that seems not okay and you don't say anything. Totally, okay, okay, thank you. Because, oh my gosh, I mean, that that incongruity where you know, like the cognitive dissonance, where you know better. I mean, I remember being in college, I was 21 years old, I was a grown ass woman, and I remember talking to my mom and she was like slurring. And it's like I knew something was off. I was a grown woman, but I couldn't. It's like it was too scary to to admit, you know, what was going on with her. And that and reaction so was, feels like it's in your DNA. Like I re- it feels like it's coded into your DNA. You hear it. You I, and I relate so much to this. You 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 clench up. You, what's going to happen next? But you don't. It's almost impossible, it feels, well, yeah, in the moment and it to feels, do a different yeah. thing. It And for me, it was just, it's like this unmooring, um, because if that's true, then what else is true? But I want to I want to rewind, Mark, if you're willing to talk about it. Like, when I hear you express that, and those observations are not theoretical. Those are real observations from your life. And so I'm wondering, what mask did you have to wear? And what caused you to be such a, gosh, um, such a strong proponent for the exploration of truth? Because it sounds like maybe it was difficult growing up to do that. You know, I can't say that, you know, if I brought a truth forward to my father, he wouldn't have been able to hold it. But there was certainly some sort of experience where I couldn't bring my own feelings forward or, you know, and, and I mean, I could probably pick out many different aspects of what that could be. But what I realized when I was in my late 20s, when I ended that engagement is when I started to hit rewind and look back. And I remember thinking to myself, why did I get engaged when I didn't want to? That didn't make sense to me, right? And then I was like, this is the first time that I've chosen something that's truly for me at the cost of people's feelings. And it was hard to do because it meant all the judgment I would get from all the people around me, all the people who said I was afraid of commitment, all the people who were like, this is just something you do, you just surrender to it, blah, blah, blah. And I remember having this recognition that I avoided every hard conversation I ever needed to have. And so I made a rule, the moment I had that awareness, I made a rule that I would have every conversation I didn't want to have because they're the ones that matter. That completely changed my life. The second rule I made was that, and that was a dedication to truth. I didn't realize it was like this dedication to capital T truth, but it was. And it was because of how much of a life I'd built based on dancing around that shit, especially my own truths. And the mask I wore was that everything's good. I'm good. I learned how to be charming, funny. I learned how to smile all the time because I'm good. But I remember working with a psychotherapist where he said to me, I was doing sentence stems with him, which is where he says a sentence and I finish it. And the sentence he had me finish after I said something, I smiled and he said, behind my smile is. And I just collapsed. Like, because there was so much that, so much that that had been protecting for so long. And now I work with people all the time where that smile comes up and I'm like, notice, like, your response is not appropriate to the grief or to the anger. So like, just be with that. Well, thank you, honestly, for doing that work yourself so you can bring that to other people. Because I mean, I can't like, I like my, I can't tell you what I feel like in my body right now listening to you. It's so relatable as somebody who has also been 
a, a people pleaser and hey, you know, and smiling and fawning and all those things. And the the cost that it's it, you know, I, it's I've incredible incurred the cost. and the work, yeah, for you know decades now to unwind that to get back to the the truth of who I am. Right. And honestly, it's even in service to the show. So that it's like, hey, um, let's tell these hard truths that are embarrassing um, so that other people can go, oh, my gosh, I'm not alone. So I really I do appreciate your doing that work and being honest and God bless that psychotherapist, because that that to me, it's like like what we are being called to do. But again, rewinding when you talk about those hardest conversations, give me, you know, give me an example of like the one that was the hardest or in the top three hardest how did you approach it and what'd you do? Well, man, since then, I mean, I left my job in pharma. I started writing about relationships. That was big because the first time I ever put a post up on Facebook, here was this guy who'd spent a large amount of time trying to cultivate the uh, perspective that he was a ladies man and a player and had frosted tips to all of a sudden I'm writing about emotion and relationship. And through my engagement ending, you know, really diving deep into this this whole landscape that was not is like dudes aren't writing about this stuff or thinking about these things. So that was hard. I mean, I just mean as a, like a one of the most biggest leaps I've ever had to take was actually saying I'm going to be who I am, and and also recognizing when I'm not and when I am. So like really figuring out that congruence only comes with the recognition of incongruence, right? Like integrity is only found through being out of integrity, and and I don't think it's ever a it's never achieved because you're always learning more about yourself and your values and what matters to you. And so that the hardest conversation though, I've had to have since then, um, my wife and I, when we were together for four years, we broke up. And when we broke up, that was, we did a closing ceremony for the relationship. And that was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. What, and it was the can, most like, so beautiful like, can you, and profound. Can you summarize, like, I mean, did you have to go first? Yeah. Like, I feel like in these parts, like what you're talking about, like you're going first. Oh, man. So we had, I mean, we we had been in that relationship with a lot of, you know, care and concern and compassion and, and skills. Like we had already developed quite a few together and independently. Um, and I said to her, hey, like, I've never done this, but what do you think about doing a closing ceremony for our relationship? And I went on the internet and looked up do other crazy people do this? And they do. So then I found a, a group of questions that I thought would be really good for us to do. So I sent them to her. She agreed. And, you know, I pulled up. We were about a month broken up. And I pulled up to the house that we had been living in. That's where she was staying. And I was sitting in the car outside. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do this. And and then I, um, I just got emotional thinking about it. But then I thought to myself, do I not want to do it because I just genuinely don't want to do it? Or do I not want to do it because the person who does this doesn't exist yet? And the answer was uh, the second one, unfortunately. So <laughs> I went in because I have a rule that if it scares me, but I need to do it, I do it. So that one was art. I, um, we lit a fire. And we played music that was memorable to both of us for our relationship. And we answered three questions. The first one was, um, what were we most grateful for about the other person and why? And we took turns. And then, and that was hard to do because you're like holding an ending as you're, as you're like really, exp <laughs> you're like, this is ending. And yet I have so much love pouring through me. The second one was, what was our favorite memory? Or what were our favorite memories? Oh my God, that was gutting. That was, you know, that was like the level of tears that just, shoof, you know, it has like a musical score and fire going to it. <laughs> Ryan Gosling comes uh, waltzing across <laughs> yeah. the room. Okay, I got you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and then the last one was, uh, what did we hope for the other person? That was harder to access, uh, and we were honest about that. Like, oh, I hope you find your person. It's like, I can't access that authentically right now, but I, I do. I just can't express it in a legitimate way. And um, yeah, that really set the template for 
I didn't expect to get back together. I was done. Like it was over for me. And, um, but it set the template for the foundation to be able to get back together. I didn't realize that until hindsight because it was the absolute demonstration of unconditional love that this container can change. This relationship can change, but love didn't go anywhere. It and, reminds me you know, of that edict of like, leave your part, any partner you've had better than when you found them. And so like, what did bring you all back together? And, and yeah, how you, long did that take? And, and yeah, I, I'm dying to we know. We were apart 10 months. Um, and what brought us back together is, you know, we had, we had been in contact a few times during that time. Um, and you know, at this point, this is when like the, the public health, uh, experience was starting. So here you are in no contact with the person that, you know, you, you love and care about deeply. And <laughs> there's all this fear going on and, and drama. So there was a lot of tests to, are we going to dishonor each other's boundaries? But we didn't. Um, she wrote me a message. We had been in contact a few times, came back together a few times. We were like, no, nah, this doesn't, it's not fit. And then the last time she messaged me, and was like, I'm really interested in exploring this. In our previous relationship dynamic, she had been more ambivalent, like not sure if she could do it. We were, I was very clear about wanting kids and when I wanted them. And, and that deal breaker kept getting moved. Um, there's a lot of layers to this. We go more deeply in, in the book. Uh, but yeah, she sent me a message and said, Hey, I'd like to chat about this. Are you open to it? And I was like, yeah, I'm open to it. And we got together and she was like, look, I'm ready to have the conversation about kids. I'm ready to do that. And I'm ready to choose you. And yeah, yeah, it was, it was a weird feeling because the previous relationship, I had felt like she never chose me or like didn't, not never, but didn't choose me fully. And the healing of that for me was that I finally chose myself. Like I had been in all these relationships where I never felt fully chosen going back to probably when I was 18. And it was like, I never had a fierce advocate for myself. I was meant to be that, you know, and, and that's why it's so important to have a parent who installs a sense of self, you know, that, that through validating and attuning to a child, they have this sense and the experience of their own separate self. And that it is worthy of love, admiration, and respect. Totally, except you can't give what you don't have, right? And so then, as a grown-up, for you know, you've chosen, I've chosen, Joanna's chosen to to learn these things that we didn't necessarily get, right? And and it's and it's hard and it's confusing. In fact, I was just thinking this morning. You know, I'm I'm getting ready, I think, to have a, a pretty serious conversation with my dad. And we're super close, and there's so many great things about my parents and all the stuff. But when I think, so it's, for me, it's less about blame, and it's less about almost like what they did wrong. For me, it's like what I didn't get and what I am healing from. You know, does that make sense? So it's like I'm not, I'm not interested in blaming anybody. I, I'm really not. Like I'm, but I am really interested in. I mean, even you talk so beautifully about the um, grieving the loss that you have right from um failed relationships and from um maybe what you didn't get as a as a child and say okay let me you know let me sit with that that um ache so that then i can move past it and i feel like it's just it's a gift to talk to you because it feels like it's just like oh that's the work you've done well i want to growing from what andrea just said you said something of much earlier that really really uh, it was like a hot poker in the air where I was like oh you said that we want men to be more in tune with their emotions and then we reject them or tell them to zip it when they bring those emotions to us and I'm writing a book about teenage boys a parenting book and I keep running into something similar right and I wonder like as a society what are we so afraid of happening if we let boys and men really express their emotions, that's what I can't figure out because we say we want it. And then when they do it, we reject it. We're like, don't really want them to do it. And I keep thinking, what is it we're so afraid of men and boys saying? Well, I think on a very deep 
understandable level, there's a fear that male emotion means danger, you know, because if you think about it, the, the emotions that we tend to amplify are, are in the news and everything is about aggression. So it's better to suppress all feelings because, you know, I remember interviewing um, Harriet Lerner, who's a really incredible writer and teacher in relationships. She's a psychologist. And she said that the reason that more women seek out emotional and relational information is because every subordinate group needs to learn the needs and nuances of the dominant group. And so there's very much a survival reason that women need to learn emotion and relation and how to understand it, how to regulate other people, how to bring them down, you know, all that kind of stuff. Cause life literally can and still can depend on that. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, we send men to war to die, which now we send everybody, but we send, we've previously sent men and more men do go and more men work in jobs that have more fatalities. So we're quick to let that happen. But we definitely, you know, I think there's a, there's been an important um, balancing of power that needed to happen in the direction of women. Absolutely. And my concern has been that, but we've, in doing that, forgotten about men in a way that we blame this whole system and everything that operates, we blame it on men. You know, but like any relational system, we're all participating in it. Now we could, of course, talk about how power is works and and did people even have the ability to speak up or stand up? Of course, not always true. Um, but now we live in a time where that is possible. And, you know, in Brene Brown's research, she talks about how when a man cries in front of his partner, she is like, like gets angry with him that she's turned off by it. And I think that that's a generational thing, too, because and I've always like if I go on TikTok or something and I hear people saying like, you know, men could show up more emotionally. Men could show up more, more vulnerably and they choose not to. And I, I, I want to, it, it makes me, it gives me that feeling of like, you're not listening. It's like, we literally beat this out of boys and men for generations. They literally got beat up for being vulnerable. They literally were, their lives were in danger for breaking that mold. And we as women have to be very careful that we're keeping in context how much growth generation from generation x which is me to generation z which is my boys that growth is massive and it's like we just have to have a little bit of sort of generosity with each other as we try and figure out how the world is shifting and and changing a little more like are they choosing not to do it or are they are they battling some force that at one point was literally life-threatening? Just try and keep this in mind. <laughs> I mean, it's a great point because it's like looking at a heroin addict and saying, just quit. You know, we're projecting our own access to emotion or our own access to free will onto someone else. But, you know, if we traded experience and experience and self for self or any other human, we'd do what they do, you know? The... The idea that, like, why don't men just choose it? I think there's a couple frameworks that are really important here. One is that it's true. Like, why men do need to show up better. Men need to develop more emotional fluency. This is evidenced in 70, 80% of women file for a divorce, you know? it's So it's evidenced by what's going on relationally. It's also evidenced by the complaints that we hear about men in relationship. But then you have this other side where it's like the way that relationships have evolved if you're sitting beside a dude in a war field and he's crying, he's not great to fight with, right? So we have these evolutionary things that are framed men to not have grief and that a man who is crying is, I, I get that on a deep sense, there might be a lack of trust in a man who's crying. So how do, because we do this to little boys, as you're saying, we do this, we're like, you're fine. Don't worry, you know, like keep it oh, up. The saying up. you're fine. I mean, I've had to, I've had to ring that out. You know, it's like you're trying to, uh, to, to help reg. You know, back to the co-regulation. You're trying to help regulate them, and when they're not feeling fine, and you realize as a parent how effed up that is, because they're not fine. So to be told that you're fine when you're feeling terrible, it's like, just like I'm gonna say. Like, can we just stop doing that as parents yeah. and just, you know, I made this shift. Yeah. I made this shift from saying, um, you're okay. It's going to be okay yeah. to saying, 
to saying this isn't forever. So yeah, like that, that's, my what, yeah, son, that's what I try to do yeah. with my son too, just to say my son hey, had a you know, horrible high fever and he's mm-hmm. 16 and he's six foot five. He's huge, but he was just you could tell he was like spirit was broken by this fever. And I was like, it's so bad right now. It's so bad. I hear you. Nice. In a few days, you're going to feel so much better. And I thought I had to really consciously go at it and and switch that. And I wish yeah. I'd thought to do it when he was two instead yeah. of 16. Well, that's but a, That's a beautiful thing about parent. But I think about trying to be yeah conscious parents to say, OK, I did it wrong before, but now I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to keep trying to do it right. I'm going to give a shout out. I can't help. I mean, we're talking about emotional men. Hello, Jason Kelsey. <laughs> I mean, how cool to see the outpouring of people that really applauded him um, about his recent announcement to um, to leave the to retire from the NFL, um, and and Jason as well on their show got teary and so forth. So I'm I am grateful. I feel like yes, there are many probably centuries, maybe more than that of men, it, of it being not safe to show their emotions. But I, I feel heartened as a mother of two young men, two teens and tweens, to see that some of those norms, little by little, are starting to break, at least, you know, it, it, you know, especially from like these big burly guys from the NFL. Um, but I want to go back to um, hard conversations. You are the anti-cancel culture hero we need right now. I just, I love listening <laughs> to you oh, wow. talk about having, no, in all seriousness, it's it's no bueno for our society when it's not safe to disagree um, and have a reasoned, informed opinion and a thoughtful opinion and, you know, and to make sincere mistakes. I, I'm I'm grateful that you've been so vocal about saying, hey, we need to do better as a society. And even, uh, you know, talking about how these conversations, what did you say? Non-binary conversations, right? But this idea of of where the difficult conversations can take us in our relationships and more broadly as a society. I mean, the answer is yes. And yet due to social media and there being so much judgment, it's it's risky to do so. I I feel like at times I've I have been so disappointed with myself when I didn't advocate for myself. And yes, it was easier not to, or I let the thing slide. And I mean, let's face it, that's why we have the Me Too movement. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that have emerged because it doesn't feel safe to speak up. But without speaking up, we we really incur a greater cost. So talk to me about your being the, what did I say? The, um, the anti-cancel culture hero. So we need now. <laughs> That's a big title. I, well, first off, thanks for sharing and, and thanks for that title. You know, I definitely don't think of myself as that. I think, you know, we have all these perceived binaries in, in, in how we're supposed to dialogue about things that, that you're either pro something or you're against it. If you have any crit- criticism of anything, especially sensitive ideologies or sensitive topics that are culturally sensitive, you're instantly seen as against that thing. And I'm like, the criticism of something does not mean the rejection of it. And this is interesting because it overlays so many of our cultural momentums, which is politically, you see this, you see this in the conversation about the public health stuff that's happened. You see this in the conversation about gender. These are all, but, but like... What's so fascinating is it, there's so many layers. One is that how do we even know how to have and explore nuance when the platforms that we tend to spend the most time on only show short form content that celebrates absolute positions and amplify perspectives. So you have that really cultivating and amplifying it. You have some, you have social media making its way into the hands of young people who do not have the nervous system capacity when they're teens, and especially early teens, single digits shouldn't even be touching these things. And and developmentally, it's important. Their brains can't even handle all of this. But you look at the correlation to anxiety and depression and mental health issues of young people who are now teenagers, and some of them in college, and some of them beyond college now in the workplace, they're, you layer over cancel culture with that. And it's like any opinion that I don't like 
and this is correlated. The book uh, Coddling of the Amer American Mind talks about this. Such a good book. And they talk about how it, if you look at the, parent, the parenting style of the 90s and 2000s, it was called snowplow parenting or helicopter parenting. So really, this is this parenting style that doesn't allow kids to experience any challenge, any pushback, any, you know, they're calling the kids school about a test, you know, like when kids should be advocating for themselves, obviously at a certain age. And so when these kids then get to college, they bring the same expectation that the world should accommodate them, that they shouldn't experience friction and any experience of friction is, should be canceled, not them alter their belief, thought or feeling or identity. So you have all these layers operating and then you have social media, which amplifies all of this because the algorithm will present you more of what you like to reaffirm what you think. And you can just cancel what you don't like. You can just shame it. Yeah. And the young brain, they know this now from functional MRIs. The young brain tends toward binary thinking and extreme thinking. And it's the young brains who are running social media. You know, they're the ones getting going so viral, consuming it and and making the videos. They're really good at it. And and that's not necessarily a bad thing because think of how many social movements started because young people refused to see the nuance and things for better or for worse, right? But then when all of the adults in the room start to jump on board and then you get those really extreme versions where a life is ruined, which I believe is personally, I think that's pretty rare. That's when you start to go, okay, let's let's oh, get I don't our hands back rare. on the wheel. I, I don't think it's rare. It's pretty I, rare. I mean, to have in reality like a, in can through cancel culture? Yeah. Oh my I, God. I don't know if there's know. very many examples. Catherine professors, Riffin. lots of professors have had their lives ruined. A lot of students, a lot that never make the news. Oh my God, totally. I mean, one of my closest friends was canceled and it's like, you got to, you know, and it's like you go into obscurity. So- so in in terms of what you're doing, are, do you feel like are people responding to you? Are other people either quietly or, or not so quietly saying, oh, my God, Mark, thank you, because you know what? We're all effing sick of this. Yeah. I mean, it's codependency, right? If I'm not willing to bring forth what is actually true for me and I'm coddling people's feelings, then I'm not actually creating the type of world that I want to live in. I'm agreeing to operating at the other person's lower capacity for dialogue. Like, that's what I think is so wild about the world today. This is a social movement. This is actually a social movement. But hang on, I just interrupted you. Cause, and I read that you you have that written somewhere, but say it again, because I think it, it you frame it beautifully. So say it again, please, about um, how like the kind of the common, the lowest common denominator. Yeah, we've created the circumstances where the people who decide what we can talk about and our capacity to dialogue about it are the people with the least capacity to dialogue and the people who have the lowest capacity for difference. So we end up, because of cancel culture, actually oscillating around the people who have the lowest capacity and the lowest skill set, where we should actually be modeling for people through longer form content and conversations like this. You know, how do you disagree and actually come to uh, either a recognition and respect of difference, but also perhaps agreement. You know, like all these different subjects that are so inflammatory, there is a place in the middle where everyone can see each other through. And I, I think because we spend so much time online rather than sitting down and breaking bread with people who have different views, like if I sit down with someone who has a completely different perspective, you know, my experience of being in the US in the last while is that like, and this might this is definitely changed. But initially, when uh, in your twenty sixteen election or twenty fifteen, I forget what it was, uh, then all of a sudden, no one could sit down with a Republican. Like everyone just hated Republicans. And I was like, as someone who was neither of those things, because I'm Canadian, I was like, wait, but that's like your uncle. <laughs> like, like he's still a nice guy. He just happens to have voted this other way. And I just started to see like they're not invited anymore to dinner. So now you end up with an echo chamber, even at your dinner table is where dinner tables were the places that you could have these differences, you know, assuming that there's. Well, what do you think? I mean, so let me that. ask you about this, because it, it, it's like there's uh, it's uh, I feel like the common idea is like, oh, they're snowflakes. They they you know, there are people, um, particularly younger people that feel super uncomfortable talking about things that are objectionable to them. And on the one hand, you want to protect people. And yet at the same time, it's like. Um, there is no violence, like they are just words. You know, I feel like there are quite a few people 
uh, that have said, wait, we are going to become weaker if we can't tolerate hearing objectionable points of view. And I realize there are things that are sincerely objectionable, like um, white supremacy, Nazism. Okay, there are things we can, the vast majority of us would say those are objectionable. But then there's a lot in the gray area. I don't know. I guess I'm just wondering, like, what do we do with these people that feel so imposed upon that they aren't even willing to have the conversation? And maybe that's what you're doing. Well, we stop accommodating them, right? Like the moment that I don't mean you don't accommodate people's sensitivities, but if, if if your sensitivity shapes every conversation, well, everyone's sensitive about something. So, you know, it's like we can't, emotion isn't always rational, right? Like if we're reactive about something, if my nervous system is dysregulated because I feel rejected, that doesn't mean that my response is rational and now the world has to accommodate my dysregulation. Totally, thank you. you. Know? Yes, it's on you. But let me, right? let me give you guys a, a just a personal example. So when I was at UCLA- Did I offend you today, Joanna? <laughs> no, I, oh, it takes a lot more than that to offend uh, me. Okay. Um, I just, yeah, I just disagree. <laughs> yeah, I just disagree. I, yeah. I agree in general, but here's an example of, I'll just say this to start this, to, to give you a little tone of what I'm going to say. I think there's a pendulum. I think there's a pendulum that says, Certain groups of people can say anything they want with absolute impunity. And then there's a pendulum that if went all the way If your name is went, George Clooney. <laughs> well, no, no, but like think about my grandfather, a white doctor from Muskegon, Michigan, could say anything he wanted and had would have had no repercussions, okay, ever. He could have been racist. He could have been sexist. He was absolute protection of this guy, okay? And I, and mean, I don't know. I don't think he was. You mean his power and- yeah. So you're he was saying wealthy, that a he male was educated, doctor, wealthy, white. Yeah. In he could say the, that anything, time. do okay. anything. And then we we can swing the pendulum and say, we don't even want to hear from white men and we need to protect everybody who is not a white man. That's the opposite. And I'm not a fan of either of those. But let me give you an example of when I was at UCLA, and this was very early 2000s in the women's studies department, and I would, I'm a media critic, it was a media literacy uh, course, and we had to watch Clockwork Orange. And someone said to me, well, Ugh, you have a history awful. of, well, yeah, we had to watch it though. You have a history of sexual assault. And you should say, we're like, you have a history of sexual assault that you've talked about. You might not want to watch it. There was no option for me not to watch it. And I sat in this stadium seating classroom with 200 people at UCLA. And I was in a state of absolute freeze the entire time. I, I, I can feel it now the this like chill i had no choice there was no language around trigger there was no language around i can't watch that because i was sexually assaulted and i know it's just basically like rape scenes and that was why we were watching those scenes was because it was about sexual assault and violence and whatever and that language didn't exist so the question is if I were to say that now or a few years ago, it'd be like, well, you're trying to cancel. <laughs> you're trying to cancel Clockwork Orange. And why aren't you stronger that you can't just go into that classroom and say, I'm not going to let my triggers own me? And the reality is there's a there's a happy medium there. And we have to remember, we don't want to accommodate for every individual, but we want to allow individuals to heal and find their power in their own time. At 23, I wasn't able to say, I don't want to get a fail because I'm not there. I don't want to get a zero, but I can't watch this and show up to work tomorrow. And yeah, so and I think we easily forget that a lot of the good parts of wanting to control speech come from wanting to help other people feel okay to not hurt them. And if we can recenter the pendulum to how do I empower people? How do I help people all have equal access to things instead of this side or this side of the extreme, then we can get rid of cancer cult cancel culture and maybe invite in something different. So if you think about how we say uh, where your attention goes, your energy flows, how many times have we talked about how much we hate cancel culture today? Like we're putting a lot of energy onto whole, something we hate. Yeah, although I will say that the discussion, I don't hate cancel culture. I yeah, I was going to say, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's been the case. I think it's saying I think it's, how we're, we're trying to do something about it. At least Mark is. 
<laughs> well, I think it's a necessary um, retaliation to right. a lack of accountability. But what do you want? What do yeah. you want? Not what do you not want? You can have annihilate. You can have a. You can have accountability without annihilation, right? That's a. Be- I, I yeah, forget where I, I like heard that. that, but I like it. And it's calling in. Let me say that you know. First off, I'm sorry that that was your experience in your college, and colleges should be able to accommodate for. From my understanding, the research shows that trigger warnings are actually not helpful in terms of like furthering our ability to dialogue about things that. There's this fine line, right? Because we want to accommodate people's experiences and yet we can't frame the whole world around someone's experience who's hyper traumatized and can't be exposed to certain things, which is totally understandable. So it's like, how do we give the resources and healing to someone who can't sit in a room instead of making the room not exist? You know, like, like should no one watch Clockwork Orange? I had the same problem with Clockwork Orange. I couldn't watch it because of that sexual violence. Yeah. And so I had not experienced really sexual trauma, but it was disturbing. I don't like watching those types of things. And I had to watch it in high school. And, you know, I can't imagine yikes. having left the room. What's happening in the Canadian high schools? Jeez. Major know, yikes. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, does it mean the, the like, the books should no longer exist? Like, right, uh, yeah. what's the ones uh, they're yeah, canceling no, now? Yeah, no, it goes, it, right. you, can, agree. you can take it to the, or, the ultimate conclusion. It's not good. Right, and we want to rewrite history and change language in books so that people yeah. aren't offended by the word fat and, and things or like that. Or slavery. And again, they want right. to take slavery out of history books because people that's... are too delicate to hear. And this is that line of like everyone's speech is offensive to someone. So mm-hmm. this is the yeah, argument of free speech, which I totally, I, I understand the sensitivity to speech, but I'm also looking at these conversations about gender and I'm like, there is so much nuance to this. Like I look at what's happened to J.K. Rowling and I'm like, Okay, yeah, she yeah. has said some things, but I'm like, to say that a biological woman is a woman, it's like, well, that is true, but it's like, there. I get that, that even the statement I just said, said she, is she inherently, her first statements, were they transphobic? So you think without, uh, have you ever seen the professor break it down with a student who calls him transphobic, who calls the J.K. Rowling transphobic? Um, I listened to all of the witch trials of J.K. Rowling, have you they heard that? Wasn't yeah, that so fantastic. good? The, what a good I show that was. I thought they were great. Was. And I'm also like, why can't we have this conversation? Like, this is such an important conversation. But that podcast had trans. that conversation. It that did, was but... what's so, so exciting about that, that podcast, I think. But being able to talk it through and hear everybody's perspectives and, and, and go through it without it being like, if I'm like, Mark, I disagree with you about J.K. Rowling. I want us to still be able to be friends. <laughs> and we should you know be I mean? able to. Yeah, should be that's, able to that's what we both want. Yes. But I want to go back to the accountability thing um, because I feel like it just you just used accountability um, versus annihilation. Mark, you talked about um, it, that you embarked on this part of your career. You You commented that you knew you needed to be accountable. So what do you mean by that? And how do you hold yourself accountable? Well, I think it's to... Uh, doing my best at living what I talk about, you know, at being able to hold difference, at being able to, you know, I found during the height of the pandemic, I was angry about some things and the way that things were ha- handled. And that didn't make me open to dialogue oh. and discourse. And oh, my nice. wife once said that to me. Yeah. And she was like, you know, your videos are creating the same division you're trying to fight. And I was like, oh, is this liberated oh. love? <laughs> yeah. Oh not, no! But um, that's awesome that that she could say that and you could I, hear it. Well, as soon as she said it, I was like, "Oh man, that's true." Like, how do I participate in these conversations, even with anger, but actually just keep practicing to maintain openness? Because no one listens to someone yelling at them. Actually, at the basis, if your nervous system is dysregulated when you speak, people get dysregulated. So. You know, it's like, I, I yeah, there's like something operate. in the magnetic field of our emotions. Yeah. I'm convinced, right? Because you it's know mirrored, it. the mirror neurons. Yeah, the mirror right? neurons. The mirror I mean, neurons. like, I, I feel like there are so many ways that it's a tell, right? As much as, you know, it's like through gritted teeth, you're not going to, you're not going to fool anybody. Yeah, I think this, uh, the, so the accountability is really about like, can I live everything that I talk about? And, and how does a message that's not incongruence land? It doesn't land, you know? So it's like, I think of um, I think it's Gandhi who said, um, "Let your life be your message," and that mm-hmm. really yeah, be a quote the, be from the change Ross. you want to 
you want to uh, see the world. Oh, talk to me, Ram Das, huge fan of his. He has one of my favorite quotes from him is um, that I hope that I live with the, I hope that I live with the integrity that the truths that live within me are the same as the truths that live outside of me. And when those, when that is not true, I'm sending a message of both love and fear. And so I think about that a lot of like, what is true in my experience that I don't share and people don't see, you know, that I hide. And my work All is right, to bring tell it out. All right, tell us. Yeah, I mean, no, and by the way, so <laughs> well, two things. One, I, but first, even before then, like, I just love it and I'm so grateful. And you are the person I need in my life right now. Honestly, it's uncanny that we're talking because it's, you know, you talk about not wanting to wear the mask or however you say it. Like, that is where I am in my life right now. It is so freeing and it is so scary. And to say to yourself and to the world, I'm going to hold myself accountable back to the universe hitting you with a two by four. Well, that's inviting scrutiny, right? But that's what you're, it's like you're, you're answering the call for yourself. So I, I love it and I'm grateful. But then, okay, so now <laughs> what, wait, where have you, where have you screwed it up and tell the truth that, uh, that everybody else then can go, okay, we're not alone. Well, this comes out when? April 16th? So this information will be public. Uh, but for me, I've been really wrestling with my experience with social media for three years, wrestling with its impact on my mental health, with wrestling with its, wrestling with this recognition that I'm in relationship with something, um, which I don't believe is true of platforms that actually compensate creators like YouTube or uh, Twitter, I think now pays for impressions, but I'm like, those are reciprocal relationships. The platforms actually compensate the person putting up the thing that grows the platform. That's the whole irony of it. But my experience with Instagram as it's continued to change and Facebook too, but Facebook had a huge algorithm change in 2019 or 2018 or something that completely devastated people's pages. You know, they'd spent lots of money building out their networks and then bomb, boom, gone. And with the Instagram, I've just noticed that it's like, it feels like I'm in a relationship with an abusive person because I was feeling the other day, I had a couple of weeks ago, I'd had some sense of like, I really need to dive into how I feel about this. So I look at, a, I, I write down like, what's, why do I resent Instagram? Oh, I resent it because I feel powerless. Why do I feel powerless? Because I'm the one who's choosing that. I'm relating to it in a way that it has power over me. Well, I feel powerless because a lot of my business has been built on it. So because of that, and think about it in the framework of relationship, financially dependent. So um, the algorithm is a mystery. It will never be discovered. And the moment you think you figured it out, it changes. So now I have, uh, it's a lot like walking on eggshells with an abuser, um, with a narcissist. I, nothing is ever enough. No content is ever enough. They always want more. What time do I post? What music do I do? And I, and, and really, ultimately, what they use the platforms for, which they're allowed to be a profit-driven company, of course, is that they use it to monetize people's attention. So the more that they curate the creator to create content that monetizes more attention generally means the creator has, has to perform in order to do that. So you essentially become a conduit for extraction of other people's attention. And I started to see like, wow, this is really interesting. Like this, these platforms are not relational, they're extractive. And I was like, so if I'm feeling powerless in relationship to it, and I've tried to hire people to run my social media, every single person who runs my social media, but runs social media as in general, just, I'm sure you guys know some, they always end up getting to a place of high psychological strain. Always. I've yet to meet someone who can run social medias and improve their mental health. It's impossible. <laughs> And uh, PSA, don't go into that career. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't. The people who are really good at it are probably the most emotionally healthy because they can compartmentalize it or maybe that's yeah, They unhealthy. can go home and they can, <laughs> yeah, they can uh, put their work away. They don't feel like they're yeah. uh, uh, enslaved to it. And that's not me. I'm not that person. No. No, I'm not either. I don't think, I think the compartmentalization is right. Look, I, for some people that those platforms are in alignment. There was a time they were in alignment for me. I met my wife on it. Like I right. appreciate, I built a business on it. But I'm going to delete my Instagram. <gasps> Does anybody else oh my know that? Gosh. Is that? Are we breaking news? <laughs> Holy cow. Well, people will know when this comes out. But yeah, yeah this is coming out on Monday. Mark. How wow. do you feel about that? I feel liberated. I feel like it's something that 
I've been working with lots of people on it and it's like, can we hire someone to run it that that would keep you at a distance from it? And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, that's like okay. hiring oh. someone to be in a relationship with the abuser. Oh like, my God, I've I got so many, yeah, I've got so many millions of questions. So what will be your primary way? Because you've got a huge audience, you have over a million engaged followers, you bring so much wisdom and heart and, and honesty and courage through Instagram. So what does that mean for you being able to shine your brightest and help a lot of people? It means doing it through different avenues. So I'm going to use YouTube and my podcast. And um, I just feel like there's uh, the time, my time on the platform has come to a close. And it feels like all the energy I put into figuring out all these things, algorithms and all this stuff, is a waste of my time. It's like I could put that into creativity and long form content and documentaries and videos and conversations and podcasts that bring me alive, like bring me alive, you know? Well, as as a uh, CEO who's built a successful publishing business on the back of uh, Google, um, you know, and social media, I'm 100% with you in terms of the downside, but I also, I mean, without Google, your Tingo wouldn't exist. And I would be surprised if Mark Groves was the famous superstar that so many people love if it wasn't for Instagram, right? I mean, and so no, when I think be. of those extractive relationships, there's something to be said about that. But I also really admire your, the integrity of your saying, I'm out, I'm done. It's too, it's too great a um, uh, burden. Well, you know, the truth is that I can't be in the relationship that I have with my wife and promote a book on liberated love and be have written a book like that and then not be liberated in every relationship in my life. I refuse to participate in That's relationships integrity that with require, a capital I, dude. I refuse to participate in relationships that require my um that I that I tolerate something, which you're right, I've benefited. And what's really interesting about this, I was talking to um someone on my marketing team. And she was saying like, this is how I pitch you. So I'm really like sitting with the idea yeah. that, that yeah, I have a, to a recognize. Million, a million followers, yeah, a million just followers. kidding. It's scary, yeah. <laughs> well, she said, it's really interesting because I'm having to sit with the reality that your value is somehow perceived in your follower count, not the con the content you create. And she's oh, like, this is going to be transformative. That. I honestly, and I bet I wouldn't be surprised if you see other creators, probably not a ton, but a handful that look at you and the courage of your conviction really being a game changer. And and even, I mean, when I think about that for your team and I think about it for you, the energy that that carries, I think you're going to get, I think you're going to blow up, honestly. Like just listening to you, it's like, F yeah, like yeah. here we it's go. It's a headline. It's a headline mm -hmm. maker move. And it's, it, as but long not as for it's the authentic. Head, well, you know, what makes it, yeah, right. what makes it the headline or move? It sounds it's, like it's, it's authentic. The headline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's okay. the hard thing. Of like, I, I, I'm sure you all, I know Andrea knows Marianne Williamson. We had her on the show, but I, every morning I listen to her, um, Substack has the little morning prayer meditation. And this morning it was, may my job become my ministry, which sounds religious. But if you know Marianne, you know, ministry is more of like a God-like thing rather than Christian or Jewish or anything. And, and I've thought a lot about that and what happens sometimes the downside of that is I'm doing good work. I'm doing good work. I'm doing good work. My work is of service. I have to reach more people because it's such important work. And then it's so hard to stop doing it the way you're doing it, even if it's killing you. You start to become, you start to sacrifice yourself because of that. And I, I really sat with that when Marianne said it. And it's so interesting you're saying this about Instagram because it's Mark, how much are you limiting yourself and the men especially that you can reach who really need to hear you? And then it's um, when you do that, but then it's, um, Mark, what kind of an example are you setting for the men who do admire you by saying, this is not healthy for me. I'm going to tell you why and I'm going to stop doing it. Well, and, and his whole, his whole, yeah, his whole, uh, I would, I would expect the, the large majority of your followers will follow you to, um, to YouTube. So that's good news. Yeah. You know, and that um, authentic move is the modeling. I just have to reach them algorithmically. You know, that's again, this like the challenge is I've built 1.1 million followers and 100 and something thousand on Facebook. 
that I don't even have access to. Like I built a business in someone else's business. Oh no, we that's, get that. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, you know, talk yeah, to me. We live that. Never do that again. <laughs> yeah. As a media business, we totally get it. Um, at the same time, to the extent that you'll be saying to them, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving Instagram, follow me over here. And I realize maybe it's going to be tough to reach the entire um, million, but I don't, or maybe what you just do is delete everything and just leave your, I mean, I don't know why I'm giving you advice, but like your I know. Instagram <laughs> up that says, hey, I'm not post, you know, like for a few months, I'm not posting anymore here. Like, like it does seem like it would be in service to you, like you still maintain the integrity and in service to your followers right? Who then can say, why isn't Mark posted? Oh, okay. He went to YouTube. But I want to go back to your book. We got to wrap up because we've been talking a long time. And I know we were joking before the call. We would love to talk to you for hours. You got to come back on our show, Mark. Um, I would love to. I'd love but to. But Liberated Love, you've touched on it a little bit, but this is an exciting new book. I'm super excited to read it. Um, what are the one or two things you're most proud of? Or when you think of all the other books in this space, what do you feel like you and Kylie totally nailed? And Kylie's Man, your co your what a beautiful um, question. Your uh your your co writer. Yes. Yeah, well writing a book with your wife, I'm very proud of that. That that was the good preparation for having a baby. because uh, you know, you have these clashing of two styles of creativity and two voices and, and that was really beautiful. That was an honor to do with her. Also the I mean the book is the most comprehensive healing guide to codependency you know there's the original work by melody Beattie is incredible which is codependent no more a great book talking about relationship to addicts essentially that's where the word really has its origins um but kylie and i what we found was even with all this knowledge even about codependency that we didn't really understand the deeper layers of codependency that were happening and we didn't have, we sought all the teachings. We worked with psychotherapists. We were coaches. We worked individually. But there was a deep layer that we had to put together by going through it and breaking up and then coming back together. And these are these deeper, more subtle codependent hooks that people create. But hang on, let me just interrupt because so I think there are going to be a whole bunch of people that are like, I, you're saying codependent. I don't know what you're talking about. That it doesn't apply to me. I'm not buying your book. So can you phrase it in a way that's like, what what that behavior looks like because then people be like oh my god that totally is me yeah you know I, what I mean thank you yeah the so the framework of the book really offers the opportunity to walk people through how to move from behaviors like people pleasing not using your voice codependency is the word we would use to describe this it's the framework of like generally one person who is abandoning themselves and prioritizing everyone in their life. And then there's the other person who is often being prioritized, but that person generally will identify as a problem. Like they have a, have the issue that needs to be solved. We know this in the framework of a relationship of an enabler with an addict, but this actually, this dynamic exists in almost all relationships in subtle ways. And so the book really breaks down these patterns. We define codependency in the book as when we source from some when we source our safety and security from something or someone at the cost of our own selves our own health and our own well-being so who doesn't hasn't done that right like, well so it's it's basically unhealthy i mean if i was just to say this is a compelling actionable book on unhealthy relationships where you know i mean and you said the people pleasing not using your voice you used a few minutes ago walking on eggshells like I think of my my own relationship, I'm like, you know, I'm working super hard to like break free of those patterns. I need your book. Yeah, if you're single dating in a relationship, it's for you because it really is. If you're hitting the same patterns, can't it picking the same people, can't get past the same fights. It's it overlays also what's different about it than any other book written in this space is that it overlays not just your relationship blueprint attachment. It actually integrates the nervous system and how the nervous system works so that there's because there's no true healing without healing the nervous system. And this is a more recent conversation in, in the world of psychology and somatic health, somatics being the body and, mm -hmm. and the conversation about the nervous system. Well, I loved, I was listening to Huberman the other day and he was talking about the, uh, what is he called? The uh, uh, psych, psychedelic psi, uh, physiological psi, and and how there's this, this mechanism you can use. It's the, it's the deep inhale and a short another... 
and then the long exhale. So people are like, what are you even doing? But it's this really cool way to very quickly calm your nervous system, little public service announcement. But what he said in describing this was, and let's, we'll try to see if we can put that link in the show notes because it's so good. Um, he said something that rang so clear in my mind when he said, so often we try to heal mind with mind. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the message I need right that's now. That's really good. Right? Versus saying, to your point, and this idea of somatic, so we're healing our bodies because you know we have the embodied brain, right? The nervous system is the embodied brain. And so rather than, because I've been somebody who's been, like, I, uh, Joanne and I are both triple A, type AAA Aries, like so hardcore about like oh, healing damn. mind. Yeah, I know. Watch. Oh, we didn't tell you before. Oh, we yeah, should have done a true warning. Been sneak attack. Yeah, yeah, sneak attack. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, the idea of, I mean, I'm so on fire with this now for me and my journey and for people that I love and care about. I want to share my, my amazing audience um, here to continue to try to heal mind with mind. I mean, listen, I'm for all, all for using the mind, but I think for the vast majority of us, uh, healing mind with mind is insufficient. So I'm I'm really glad to hear you talking about with your book, Liberated Love, that you're incorporating how our bodies using, I'm guessing, like breathing techniques and different ways that we heal physiologically and that that, you know, and things like mindfulness and so forth, obviously, you know, are are part of the wellness triangle. But so often we don't think about these things in terms of relationship. And so for me, like this is my sweet spot. It's like, ooh, it all comes together in relationship. And that's and talking we, about mm -hmm. the liberation. Are we all love Dr. Stan Tatkin? He's amazing. He said something on our podcast, which was that our default is I'm feeling badly it must be your fault. That that is a default in our relationships. And it actually is perfect for what you're saying about codependence, where when we're so intertwined with each other and it's so bound up that I wake up in a bad mood, maybe because I eat too much sugar yesterday, maybe I, whatever it is, I look I look at my husband and I'm like, oh, that guy. Yeah, that that's somebody guy. else's fault. It's never me. It's always yeah. the other guy. And right? the or moment, other person. yeah, the moment Stan said that, it liberated me from that default setting. Dan, we love you. Stan's yeah, no, it's so good. Yeah, you had said something earlier, Joanna, about like it feels like it's in your DNA, the response. And it is, you know, like these are the somatic imprints in how we respond to things and also the, because we haven't been taught another way and our nervous system doesn't have the other pathway available to it. So we have to learn, we talk about in the book, increasing even our capacity for good triggers we can get triggered by vulnerability and openness and safety which doesn't sound like a rational thing to get triggered by but if it's associated with trauma then of course they the, the irony we want to heal the thing but they live very close together you know and so the, it, none of it is complete without being able to to really well, I just want to let I want to let some people off the hook, starting with myself. And you had a great you had a great Instagram the other day that I just saw uh, Mark talking about how we beat ourselves up when we're on a healing journey and then we get triggered. And I loved how you I was like, oh, like I said, you are the guy you are the guy I need now. Thanks for being on the show where you talk about how the the beauty of these triggers occurring again in our life is that it gives us the chance to respond rather than react. And I, I often think, oh, this is my chance for mastery. And yes, I F it up at least half the time. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I guess I'll wait for it to come back because then I can try again. Go seek out triggers. I know. I'm going to seek them out. I, that wouldn't be unlike me, AAA Aries. No, but I say this because even this idea of the somatic uh, you know, experience and the DNA printing, and I don't, you know, I'm not using biological terms, of course, but I think that's generate. I mean, what what we get as human beings is generational trauma passed down over so many generations. And I just I want to let myself and I want to let everybody listening off the hook because it, it's like this this reversal, these patterns that we're identifying and then changing really are in our 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 genetic code. And it's not just changing your mind, right? It, it takes so much work. It, so much of this, especially if you come from, you know, a lot of trauma and, and addiction and so forth, 
and I realize there's degrees of this, but it just, I, I do feel so passionately to say, can we all just be a little more gentle with ourselves, especially those of us who are so intentionally trying to do better as spouses, as parents, as friends, as coworkers, right? Remembering that that codependency that Mark talks about in his book came from a very functional place when we were tiny. It kept us feeling safe. It kept us being able to connect with our parents the ways that we could. All of those things, they, that was functional. We were little and shunning it and pushing it away and being like, no, no, I'd never, I'm perfectly balanced. Everything was great. That's not really honoring the beautiful work that that codependency did for you when you were small. Yeah, it was adaptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you get older, you can go, I don't have to stay in this pattern. And like, like that's why the title's so good of liberating love. It's like, yeah, you are liberating yourself. Yeah, the idea that you got to love what got you here, no matter what it is. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's, I mean, a, a, such a compelling way to change um, your future trajectory, so you don't feel so connected with guilt and blame and shame to the past, recognizing that it did serve you. This has been an amazing show. Mark, I sincerely, I'm so grateful to get to know you and eager to have you back on our show. Um, any Anything we didn't ask that you're burning to, I mean, I probably no, like 10, like, probably like 10 hours so worth of stuff. You guys are so good. I love it. I mean, you really, I love that you touch every subject. It's, it's honestly, it's so beautiful and that there's not like a, you can't talk about that thing here. I think that's really important. That's modeling exactly everything we're talking about and healthy disagreement and respect and and the, and that like love doesn't go anywhere when there's disagreement and yeah i'm just very grateful thanks to all of you listening too and for the people who are listening who listened to me push back and listened to andrea push back we want you to know we've had to work hard to get there because we both are pleasers and so for us to be able to say well i disagree that was work we've been doing too like we're and we're being open about it it's it's not like it's not always it. easy. Oh my God, we can I do a whole. We're going to eventually that. do a whole show yeah. on going from being a people pleaser to a not people pleaser, <laughs> and <laughs> and and we'll show all the clips when it was like, oh, we failed, oh, uh, we failed, oh, so we failed. Andre so Andrea good. and I fawning for no reason. Yeah, why are we fawning? <laughs> well, because you know we can't fight, we can't fly, we can't freeze. Okay, we'll fawn. Oh, and we'll fix. <laughs> yeah, that'd fawning. be good. Actually, yeah, that'd be that, really that's a, good a good episode. Show. Yeah. All right, we're doing that. All right, Mark, thank you so much. Mwah. Thanks for having me. Good luck with Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I loved him. Oh my gosh. What an amazing discussion. I love him. How just awesome that, that guy is. So Brian, what is the number one takeaway that you loved most that you are committed to doing starting today? Thanks to our discussion. <laughs> um, well, commitment is tough for me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I say as I buy my wife or my my fiance a wedding ring, soon to be fiance. Geez, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, exactly. I know she's gonna say yes, so I'm saying fiance because we already <laughs> talked about it. And she's like, "When are you buying me my ring? My hand is feeling very light." Mm. So, um, uh, but no, there was a, a bit that he said when it was around the time when he was talking about his fiance um, and how the the not only the fear of commitment but like wanting to make the change. He had a great line that was. The idea is centering yourself, not being self-centered. And I was like, Ooh. oh, that's, that is that's good. like, yeah. So that one, that one definitely stuck with me because there is this idea of like, you need to take care of yourself, but you don't need to be like up your own asshole. You know what I mean? That's put it so bluntly, but. Um, not yeah. selfish. Exactly. I love that. What All right. You guys? Joanna, are you ready or do I need to go with mine? I really liked how open he was. And it felt like he was willing to talk about his journey, which had a lot of ups and downs in a way that felt really authentic. And it reminded me of how I want to be more, um, that I don't have to pre-plan or cultivate ways to be honest, that when you're being authentic, you don't have to come up with a sort of informal script. I, oh my God, Joanna, I love that. Like. I feel like if I could summarize that, it's the benefit of being authentic is just that there you you're not wearing a mask. You just it's like whew, you get to be you get to be free and who you and are. And being like, in the moment. Yeah. 
right? I mean, there's like no calculation mm-hmm. involved, right? And while that can feel so scary because we're almost always wearing masks and having to calculate and so forth, the the beauty is once you start to form that new habit to replace the old habit, that that to me feels like not only is it just being true to yourself, um, but so much easier. So I love that. Uh, mine is the statement he made about always having the hard conversations. That's been something that I, I have thought a lot about. I've, you know, I've, I've long said, especially to my kids, the hard conversations are the ones you need to have. But I liked how he phrased it where I think he said something to the effect of when he realizes he is resisting a hard conversation, he's going to have it immediately. So I'm going to set that bar for myself uh, because I know I have weaseled out a number of times, both to the detriment of myself as well as when I, I think it's a gift when you have that hard conversation because nobody wants to have it. So it's like everybody's kind of like, all right, don't look over here, sweep, sweep, sweep under the rug. I'm guessing the more that I'm able to do that in my own life, the more I'm able to reach out and um, help, uh, you know, if I'm feeling the disconnection or the, you know, malcontent or whatever, I'm quite sure others are, are too. So that's my... Especially if we can do it like balance to some degree our need to please and wanting to find the best way to do anything. That's also a superpower in a way. So it's like if you can balance both, take the time oh, to totally think it through. a superpower. Yeah. When he was, you know, angry, he was talking about how his wife confronted him. It's like, dude, you're you're kind of angry and you're you're shutting, you know, you're shutting down the energy just like what you're um, objecting um, to others doing. When I think about in my own life, when I feel annoyed and whether I'm just feeling it in myself or, you know, I, I'm being a little um, curt to somebody else, like, like I know it and I know I'm out of integrity and I know it's like, it's just such a chance to, to check myself. Anyway, I feel like uh, there's just a lot of opportunity to foster greater connection. All right, uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in to Open Relationships Transforming Together. You are welcome. We would love it if you gave us feedback or advice. Um, Our email address is openrelationships at yourtango.com. We would be super grateful for you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, on Spotify, on iHeart, wherever you get your podcasts. We are working so hard to make this show your favorite. We sincerely are. We are putting our whole hearts into it because we know how important relationships are in all of our lives and and let's face it they can be really hard and it it can be pretty tough and lonely out there so we're working for you um thanks for listening and we hope you'll um uh keep listening and watching open relationships